Welcome to uh, the VR panel. I just want to say a quick thank you to Ashley, uh, to Philip, to Olga, and to Adam as well for putting on this great meetup. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them to get this organized for you guys. Um, uh, myself, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction. Ash gave a great job. So basically, uh, my name's Lex. I'm a student at UQ, and uh, I got into VR at the end of last year. Uh, it was the first time I, I convinced a friend of mine to go halves in a DK2. So we ordered that, it arrived in December. I tried it on, I loved it. I started playing around with Unity 3D and um, since then I've been interested in meeting other people who are also into VR. And so I and a few of my friends um, are the organizers of the Brisbane VR Club and we meet up once a month and uh, we met some great people and it's slowly growing and at the moment we're operating out of the Brisbane powerhouse. Um, so which is great. But, um, but yeah, let's kick it off. I'm very excited about today. These, I've met all of these guys over the course of the last six months. Um, so we're very, um, I'm still catching up with all the stuff that they do in the VR space. Um, but let's start off. We've got Wilf Watson on the end here. We've got Sean Edwards, Kieran Lord, and Alex Stevens. Uh, Wilf, do you want to give a quick intro to, um, to what you've been up to or what you do with your company, which is Phenomic? Yeah, so, uh, so Phenomics is a startup. Um, we launched it last year. Um, so a little bit of a background. Um, I too was, uh, was new to VR a couple of years ago. Um, so the Oculus Rift, seeing the success of that and um, just really inspired by this kind of reprisal, this, this comeback of virtual reality. And, uh, and at that time, I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I wanted to get an Oculus Rift DK2, um, obviously, Quite a high-end PC as well, and um, and I was looking at uh, the the maker community online and, and what people were doing, um, actually building their own uh, head-mounted displays, and uh, and I was really inspired by this, and so I, I started tinkering and uh, and and I, I started getting into 3D printing, and uh, and I was really inspired by what people were doing with mobile phones, so um, casual, I guess casual VR. Um, and how it's enabled by, by mobile devices. And so um, that was sort of the foundation for us to, to build a company. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we, we decided to launch Phenomic and, uh, and develop these uh, head-mounted displays. They're basically a phone holder, um, kind of a, a Google Cardboard on steroids. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, this is, this is what our focus is on, building, building head-mounted displays. Um, and also, yeah, just helping the developer community. So we're working on some, uh, some plugins, some SDKs uh, for Unity and uh, soon for Unreal Engine 4. And, um, and yeah, that's our focus. Um, to get, you know, awesome tools and awesome products uh, for VR developers. So, um, so I guess a little bit of a background about me. Um, I guess I'm a VR enthusiast that's um, turned into a developer. Um, my sort of main background's been in, in multimedia, so I've worked in that sort of sector since I was 16, um, I'm 26 now, and um, yeah, I just worked, worked across many different roles, um, mainly in film and television, and, um, and I think VR is very interesting um, as, a, as a storytelling medium, um, an experiential medium, um, and, uh, and so that's why uh, it was very easy for me to transition into, into VR. And, uh, and I think it's very, very interesting um, what we can you know, accomplish. Uh, we've got omnidirectional cameras now uh, with, with the GoPros, but, um, but yeah, it's an exciting time. So um, I, think, I think I answered the question yeah. a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect, perfect. So yeah, we've, we, uh, Will came along to the first VR Club meetup and ever since then I've, I've been following him and what um, himself and Dana and the Phenomic crew up at Sunshine Coast have been up to. Um, as for Sean Edwards, uh, we're quite recent. I don't think we've we've ever met other than to, for today. So yep. welcome. Um, it's great to meet you. And uh, what about yourself? Do you want to give a quick rundown of what you've been up to? I know a little bit. I yeah. know about some apps that um, you've developed for VR. My, my background is in game development. So I worked in the games industry for 10 years up until the industry crash here in Brisbane. <laughs> Uh, so I worked for Ratbag Games in Adelaide and I worked for Pandemic and Chrome, mm. did some contract work. Um, after my contract work I started develop developing my own games called Lunar Flight. Uh, I managed to launch that on Steam and about 12 months later uh, Oculus had their success with their Kickstarter 
and uh, got a hold of a DK1. It actually sat in my room for a month before I even touched it because I was in the middle of an update for Lunar Flight. But when I finally did get it out and tried some of the early demos, I was pretty, pretty impressed and quite amazed. And I was like, wow, you know, I have to put this into my game because it seems like cockpit based things are, mm. uh, are really suitable for VR. Mm. So I did that and I spent about four months integrating, pretty much rebuilding my game to support VR. So I completely did a complete pass on my whole user interface. Um, I made it contextual to work really well with a kind of a gaze based targeting system for interacting with objects. Uh, I built an entire new cockpit that was specifically built around the constraints of uh, VR in terms of how, you know, resolution of the display and all these other things. Uh, anyway, I released that and it was received quite well. I got a lot of got a lot of good uh, feedback for doing that work. Um, mm, nice. Since that time, um, I've been pretty actively involved. I spent most of last year trying to kickstart another VR project. I, I partnered up with a couple other people who owned uh, an IP. We didn't succeed in in, in that venture, um, but during that process, again, I got fairly familiar with the whole VR community, the Reddit community, traveled to the US a few times. I've had a meeting with Palmer Lucky for an hour at Oculus at their oh, headquarters. Nice. I was invited to Valve to try out Valve's early prototype technology. And again at GDC, just recently, they invited me to check out their new Vive hardware. They're sending me a development kit. Oh, sweet. And uh, sweet. yeah, so now um, uh, after the, the ZVR project didn't succeed, I was gonna just take a breather from it for a while. Uh, and uh, Matt Pierce over there, who's a the guy I used to work with at Chrome, got in touch with me and uh, I'm actually working on some mobile games at the moment, some kids' oh, wow. mobile games. Um, and that's kind of been fun and it just so happens that the company we're working with is very interested in, in the VR space and we've been doing some work for a, a company I can't talk about, but we've been doing- Top like secret. A, yeah, we've been doing a short film, so I've been able to get my hands in some VR oh, work again good. and yeah. there's prospects that we'll be doing some more in the future. Yeah, that's, we'll touch on a few of those things. Um, and uh, the next panelist here, Kieran Lord, he um, he was one of our first speakers at the VR club. Um, he was kind enough to bring along his equipment, and he operates out of River City Labs. Would you yeah say that's true? Most uh, of the time. Yeah, most of the time. Um, as a, a rogue developer for VR, if that's what you'd call yourself, how about you give us a bit of a background on your story of of getting into games and then into VR? Um, well, it's pretty simple. It basically, it's the same as. As Sean's, uh, I've been in the industry just on 10 years now, um, and started out at, at Pandemic uh, a bit earlier than Sean, and then, then went through until that, and then crashed, and then Chrome. Uh, I've also done a bunch of bunch of independent development and uh, outside the games industry doing some contracting. Um, I got into VR basically because I was bored. I was working in Austria at the time. Um, and ordered DK1, it arrived, started tinkering, um, had a lot of fun with it. And DK2 arrived and that was when I really started getting into things. Um, made a hoverboard thing that uh, unfortunately hasn't been able to be turned into a full game. And uh, since then I've been focusing mostly on mobile VR and that's really brings it up to the present. Sweet, sweet. Our um, next friend here, he's a little bit under the weather, but he made it, so close <laughs> to him. I'll try not to squeak too much, but yeah. <laughs> so Alex Stevens, yeah. you've, uh, you've been a teacher, you've also got your own company, Organic yep. Humans, which is an awesome name. Uh, and then you're also working on a horror VR experience. Do you want to give us a bit of a rundown on your background yeah. first, so, and um, then the game? Cool. So uh, I've only been in the industry for about three years now. Um, uh, basically, I started off uh, just tinkering around when I was a kid with games, mostly just little crappy flash games, um, uh, pardon the French. Um, and then uh, throughout uni, when I was doing mechatronic engineering, uh, I got a bit more serious about my OpenGL. I was a big Linux nut, you probably will see on the side of my computer, there's a Ubuntu sticker plastered along that. Um, so throughout my uh, uni, I was doing a lot of uh, little mini VR games, uh, not VR games, uh, OpenGL games on Linux. Um, and then uh, afterwards uh, I graduated and started doing web development and around about that time uh, my co-developer approached me uh, with a project that he had on Indiegogo at the time and uh, that was Montas um, and we basically got through Indiegogo, it wasn't too big of a success but um, 
was it we eventually at that exact right time um, was it, it was announced that uh, Dev Kit Ones would be coming out uh, on Kickstarter, and we were like, "Huh, this is like oddly suiting our um, time and presence and all that stuff." Um, and then about a month later, uh, was it Steam Greenlight got launched, and we basically put ourselves up on Greenlight. And about six months later, we got greenlit, and now we're on Steam Early Access. So um, we're still in Unreal Development Kit at the moment. Um, I'm currently doing a port to Unreal Engine 4. I've got some of that work just over there. Um, that's mostly going to be just a little, uh, was it an uh, animation and IK prototype? Uh, was it that I'll show you guys? And yeah, uh, ever since then, just been migrating to Unreal Engine 4. We've got another little project under wraps as well at the moment, um, and we're trying to build a really solid VR foundation for all of our games. Um, and Montas is pretty much just a first person survival horror, uh, very much like Amnesia, uh, more. Uh, Tense, more, uh, I guess, gradual, not jump squat, jump, ah, sorry, I'm choking a bit. Um, jump scares or anything like that. Um, it's mostly just building up tension and all that stuff, and yeah, and storyline. Um, so, yeah, um, and hopefully we'll be done with that project by the end of this year. So, good. Sweet, exciting. I'd, I'd love to check it out. Yep. Um, yeah, so quick note we're going to have some demos floating around. There's two Gear VRs in the room. We've got uh, one full uh, DK2 or DK1 setup? <laughs> DK2. DK2 setup over in the corner there. So we'll check that out at the very end. Just a quick show of hands from the audience. How many of you are own a DK2 or DK1? Yeah, yeah, that's about half. What about a Gear VR? Raymond, you can keep your hand up. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, and how many of you have kind of dabbled with creating VR content yourselves? Uh, in either Unity or, yep, two up the back or Unreal Engine? Yep, cool. That's awesome. All right, well, I think the first question we'll, we'll start off with is, it's a big question. I, I got asked it a couple of times too when I bought the DK2. Uh, some people in the industry were questioning whether VR is back for real. Um, that was at the end of last year, but I, I'm going to ask the question of uh, Sean in, in terms of, because you've, you've kind of been at the cutting edge of VR as it's <coughs> kind of re-emerging, if you will. Uh, what, what do you think, do you think it's around to stay, or what, what are your thoughts on uh, that? Uh, I'm not a betting man, but um, given, given the tidal wave of interest in, across all different industries, from the film industry, the games industry, mm. and all the hardware manufacturers and all the major, major corporations, are all putting their foot in the water. Um, there's, there's such a big swell of interest there. My personal opinion, based on I, I want it to succeed because I've yeah. I've seen some of the best VR there is, yeah. and I know how incredibly amazing it is and how much better it's going to get. Mm. Uh, a lot of the hardware improvements that are you know you, you can see how fast technology develops. You can mm. imagine in three to five years just how incredible it's going to get. Yet yeah, with mm. you know the resolution of displays and tracking technologies and all sorts of things. Mm. Um, Plus all, all the outlying technologies that are going on, it's like HoloLens and and uh, Google's Magic Leap and all these other things that all are happening. All the augmented reality as well. Yeah, There's a push can, on that front. Seems. Yeah, you can see like these different technologies kind of working together in different ways as mm. well. Mm. So you're yeah, using um, uh, like a Kinect uh, device mm. to use for tracking. You can imagine when that's like several generations further along, how much better that tech would be for like scanning your body into VR or anything like that. So my, my opinion is, um, I, I believe I'd be highly very surprised if it doesn't establish itself as a market and a, a sizable market. Um, I think it's going to take a little while. A little, I think yeah. I don't think it's going to be until <coughs> like, you know, Valve's releasing their consumer product around November. Oculus has announced that early first quarter next year is when they're going to release their consumer product. They already have GBR. They're on the second iteration of that. I don't think it's going to be until like end of 2017 before that market has grown enough mm. um, that. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be kind of an exponential growth too. It'll kind of climb, and then suddenly more and more people are going to be exposed to it, and it'll sort of just spread. I think it's a very compelling thing when you experience it for the first time—a good VR experience. I know yeah. a lot of people have had bad yeah. VR experiences because the person who had it didn't have the right hardware, they didn't set it up correctly, or for whatever reason, they didn't use the right software, didn't use the right demo. But when you have a good VR experience, it's really, really impressionable on you. So yeah, yeah that's, that's so true. That's so true. My my first experience was actually on Kieran's hoverboard application, so I was lucky. Had a good one. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what about yourself, Will? Uh, you're, you're betting on VR in a, in a sense. You've gone all out with your company. It's fully all about VR, right? 
Yep. Yeah, focused one hundred percent on VR. Yeah. You've gone all in. You've been in in the game for two years. Uh, just a year. Just yeah, a we're year. Pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And yeah. so it's it's awesome to see how far you've come in just one year. What what are your thoughts on on how far it's going to go or how quickly it's going to progress? Kind of like building on what Sean said. Um, do you think it'll take a long time before we get, say, for example, mass consumers getting involved? Facebook, let's note, Facebook did buy, buy Oculus, and Facebook is very much about giving access to, um, for example, with Facebook, a, a social media platform that everyone uses, no matter what age or what, um, it, whether they're not, it doesn't have to be gamers only. What about with what your thoughts are with um, VR and, and getting that into the hands of the mass majority? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I definitely would see it happening, you know, in the next year or two years. Um, it's hard to define what is mass adoption, but um, I think it'll take a while for it to become sort of used by everybody. And I, I think it's it is a niche in re, in respect to you know putting a, you know your phone to your face and having a head mounted mm -hmm. display. So it's going to be, uh, in my opinion, early adopters, are, uh, the very early adopters are going to be developers and enthusiasts. Um, and so we still have, you know, my focus has been on, on mobile, you know, mobile VR. And uh, obviously there's you know, quite a few problems with that. Um, phones aren't designed, um, weren't designed for VR. Um, I make some predictions that we'll start seeing, you know, phone companies, um, you know, brands starting to build phones that are optimized for VR experiences. So, you know, faster refresh rates on the phone screens, um, you know, higher resolutions. Um, there's still, you know, some, some issues with, um, with obviously not having positional tracking and that can cause nausea. Um, so there's still some way to go. But uh, I think for, for casual gaming, just, you know, short 10 to 20 minute gaming sessions, mm, yeah. I think uh, mobile VR has a place there. And, um, and uh, I think, uh, I think Gear, the Gear VR by Samsung is going to be uh, it's quite heavily sort of, it's already launched, but I, 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 will s I expect to see that sort of in retail stores um, mm. sort of this Christmas. Um, so I've yet to see a, see a mobile head mounted display <coughs> in, in retail yet, but uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's coming. So it's slowly here. In Sydney. Oh yeah, they have it in Sydney, do they? Yeah. In yeah. Melbourne, or at least in the Samsung stores. Yeah. They have it. Oh, by the way, if anyone wants to like jump in when everyone's talking, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, what about yourself, Kieran? Because you've you've kind of developed you've developed for the tethered experience, and then the untethered, so the mobile, and then the the PC or the the DK twos. What's what what are your thoughts? Do you think that it'll be the DK two the tethered experiences that are going to hit the ground running, and really that's going to be the main push for VR into say for gamers and then consumers, or do you think it'll be mobile? Um. Tethered, like, okay, so desktop VR and, and consoles and stuff like that mm. is definitely going to be selling high quality experiences. Mm. And there's an enthusiast market that's going to be after that. And it's going to be 99% games. Mm. There is going to be, and that will grow, that will eventually go mainstream in some form or another. Mm -hmm. That's going to take a long, lot longer. Um, what's what, gonna, what are you thinking? Maybe. It 2016, end of 2016. It's hard to say. I mean, we don't, we have, we're not far enough into the curve to know how fast it's going. Okay. Yeah. Um, the mobile one is much, my much better infection vector, in, you know, mm. to use a medical term. Um, someone's going to walk into a Telstra shop and see this weird thing on the desk, and the sales rep is just going to go mm -hmm. on their face, and they're going to walk out with one under their arm. It's that's literally how it's going to happen now you, you don't have a similar user story mm. for the desktop one unless you're already a gamer in which case you probably already know about it you've already made up your mind whether you want one or you don't want one or you're kind of ambivalent um, you don't get to the mainstream adoption level until it sort of migrates from being that for the desktop experience mm. so what we need to do to see a truly uh, a, a complete uh, adoption is for someone like Nintendo to walk out and say, here's our new console, it ships with a VR headset. Right, right. Um, whereas the, the mobile one has got a good chance of actually going completely mainstream 
within the like the short term time frame. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 very true. And also in terms of the cost barriers, for example. Well, yes and no. I mean, if you talk at uh, Oculus's projections of how much you're going to spend on buying a, an Oculus, um, a gaming PC that costs one thousand dollars right now plus a three hundred fifty or five hundred dollar headset, mm. that sounds expensive. But you got to remember that the cost of computers drops by about forty five percent per year. Yeah. So within two years' time, because they're not going to update their headset within the first year, mm. um, it's going to drop it by about half. Mm. I mean you. So all of a sudden it's going to be 750 next year it's going to be like 400 I mean it's not going to drop below 350 yet but like buying that computer is going to be cheaper and cheaper mm. um, and but to get a Samsung Gear VR that's um, well if you get another plan it, it works out a bit differently but honestly you're up for this about the same amount the headset's 250 and the so it's the same amount for a, a tethered and an untethered experience Almost. at the moment. Um, you're looking at about a grand for a Samsung Gear VR if you buy them both off the shelf without any plans. Wow. Like 250 in Australia for the headset um, and about 850 for the yep. the phone. Yeah. So yep. yeah, I mean, it, they're not really disparate prices. Mm. It's interesting because you would kind of imagine that if it's a mobile, um, you're using a phone and, and a headset, you're not requiring a full desktop PC to run it yeah. it might be a little bit cheaper but it's it's not the case well let's just let's back up the price and just break part of it off because mm. there is an element in both of these equations which is a common piece of household equipment one mm -hmm. of them is having a phone and one of them is having a computer and most people who own a gaming who play games on the PC will own a decent computer and they will yep. be upgrading generally on like a four-year cycle or something yep so whether they upgrade for this or they upgrade independent of this, eventually people are going to just have a computer and it's going to be $350 to get a, the headset. Mm. Um, same with the Samsung. This thing's going to roll out across the last three phones. It's going to be like the Note 5, the, the S6, and the Note 4. Um, obviously the Note 5 is going to be the consumer version, but that's, that's where we're seeing all this go. Um, so a lot of people will already have one of those phones or they will find out about mobile VR and that will, like, help make them to decision about hey that this is the kind of phone I want to use because it supports this stuff or maybe it's just accidental but a lot of people will already have that and their outlay will only be $250 for the headset so it's the total costs look big but the actual outlays that people will need mm. to make to adopt this technology is probably a lot less than that yeah yeah that's a good point good point um, I think we'll, we'll go to the next question and, and Alex you can you can um, you can riff off of this in terms of mobile versus tethered, the input devices with what you're creating, are you focused primarily on the current input devices that we have, for example, the mouse and the keyboard? Are you thinking about in the future, what, what are your thoughts on in terms of input devices and, and whether you want Montas or any of your other pro, your games that follow? Will they be including those sort of input yeah, devices? Yeah, so like, um, was it, I applied for the Vive, unfortunately I haven't heard back from them. Um, but uh, I definitely think that um, you really need to, like with my current demo, um, was it the uh, way everything's going, like I love everything about looking down at yourself and having um, body awareness and all that stuff. And um, having like the Vive controllers to be able to walk around and be able to actually reach out and pick stuff up and have some kind of, not haptic feel feedback, but visual feedback that you're doing something in that game. Um, I think that will be the way to go. Um, until then, I think like it is best for most um, developers who, especially for us, we're already in a niche market with horror and all that stuff. Um, and then you get a niche market in a niche market with a virtual reality headset, um, you still have to be supporting all of the old systems. So you have to really try and figure out a good combination of interfacing both the new and the old. Um, mm. And, uh, but I do think that um, the way VR is going, it definitely needs to have some kind of physical input where you can uh, kind of get like that proprioception um, happening. Yeah. Where you're kind yeah. of like reaching out to something and you can see that. And um, if a sword comes by, you have that immediate response like, ooh, to pull away and you get more immersed. That it just way. increases that level of immersion so much more. Yeah. yeah. When you yeah. see your body in there, when you're interacting with your own hands inside of. The VR space. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I do know that um, Wilf has mentioned, I don't know if it's top secret, you, you tell me if it still is, with creating, uh, w with building your own, um, your own input devices. You've mentioned that a couple of times. Do you, are you still thinking about doing anything in, in terms of that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, we're looking at, I, I didn't mention it, but so we're a team of, uh, of product designers and we've got software and electrical engineers and, um, and we are working on a, on a premium headset. Um, we're looking at building in um, technologies like eye tracking technology, which is very useful for VR. Um, one of the problems we feel, for, and for VR to be mainstream, um, is that um, solutions like the GVR are quite expensive. So you need a Note 4, it's $800 and uh, mm -hmm. roughly, give or take. Um, and then the GVR itself is around 200, I believe. So we, we really want VR to be for everyone with a smartphone. And there's, there's a good side and a bad side to that. Obviously the experience is very dependent on your smartphone. Um, but we, we try and standardize that issue. So you have all this fragmentation with different phones and different qualities of the head tracking sensors and screen resolutions and things like this. Um, what we're trying to do is standardize it. So, so with this, um, we're building a, a dedicated head tracking sensor. So that will help reduce latency across all phones. Um, phones aren't particularly accurate at, at the head tracking. Um, or they're good enough, I would say, but uh, in terms of Oculus, uh, you know, levels. Um, so, sorry to go on a tangent. What was your original question? Oh, the input devices. So now you're input on, you're devices. On the track, so, yeah. so, so we sort of see this being um, as a head-mounted display, I guess. Yeah. Um, in terms of extra peripherals, um, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're just looking at doing a gamepad controller. Um, we feel that's just a, a nice handy way to navigate the virtual world that you're in. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's mainly the, the input devices. I think, I think that's a, a good way to, for now to, to, to navigate the virtual world. Um, and in the future, um, having, um, you know, tracking the hands, I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, the goal is to create a sense of presence. And so if you can, you know, see yourself, see your hands, um, that's, you know, along the right mm. tracks there. So, yeah, definitely, yeah. um, yeah, so I sort of see that being yeah. one of the main focuses. Yeah. So, so, um, the input devices, correct me if I'm a little bit off here or peripherals, um, that I, that I know of and, and you guys, Sean in particular, you, you probably have your eye on the market more than me. I've heard of the leap motion, uh, STEM system, Razor Hydra. The, the feel real VR mask, which we, we do you guys, have you guys heard of that yeah. one? No, so yeah. <laughs> no? Uh, some of you have, we'll talk about it in a second. Um, glove one is a new one, but th there's a few other glove Pre input VR, devices yeah. that are coming up. Good. Yeah. And then the Omni, which we've, we, I know we've got one back or two backers in the room yep. who uh, <laughs> back the Omni and they're, they're, we're really excited to see that show up soon. But out of those, which ones are you most excited about or which ones are you, have, that, that isn't on my list? that you guys have kind of kept your eye on. Uh, Kieran's been, you've been working with the Wii board, the Fit board, right? Yeah, look, my answer to this is actually gonna be a bit interesting considering that I have developed heavily with peripherals. Mm. Um, none. No. I, I've, I've backed a bunch of them and I'm curious to see where they go, but that's actually very entirely experimental and speculative on my part. If you're going to try and release a game with these things, you can only in it like it's insane to develop for anything but what ships with the platform unless mm. you've got a game like elite where the, the community that plays that game is going to go out and buy joysticks regardless mm. um unless that's a safe bet and even then they don't require it the mount in fact that game they're focused mostly on playing that game with mouse and keyboard it still plays better that way so you would suggest say developers if there's anyone in the room wanting to create vr content create it for mouse and keyboard well and then gamepad seems to be everything is shipping with mm. gamepads yeah. but like this the gear vr doesn't half the units ship with a gamepad the other ship the rest of them just ship with the headset which has the touchpad touch on the side. and the button on the yeah. side um if you require the gamepad half the people out there who buy this thing can't play your content so you have to support this thing and in fact you should focus on supporting this thing is your main input source because it's that's what you know it's common denominator it's, it's i think it's a really interesting thing because there vr in itself is like it, it it's so um it's so great for so many different types of experiences mm. so yes it, anything in next cockpit base if, if, if you're driving game you really want a, a steering wheel and pedals mm. uh i've 
played some DK2 racing games at home, I own a pretty expensive steering wheel and pedals. And when you see a pair of arms in front of you, they're you know, outstretched about the same distance, turning the wheel in synchronous with what you're feeling. Yeah. Um, the whole this whole um, concept of presence for me, usually the discussion of presence, usually happens when you stop thinking about um, the experience or you know the thing how you're interacting with the space, and you just interact with it, and forget yeah. about that part of yeah. it. So uh, definitely, when you stop doing that, you just concentrate on doing what it is you're doing and not thinking I'm in a VR space and I'm having this fumbling type of interact interactive uh, problems. Mm. Um, so yeah, joysticks for flight simulators. Um, Elite this, Dangerous, I know, is, it yeah, works it, well with actually, that, right? I have yeah. a Hotters at home as well and I play Elite Dangerous with yeah. that and it's uh, it's absolutely awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and again, it's like, like Kieran was saying, it's a niche within a niche uh, type of experiences. Mm. But I, I'm of the same opinion, you know, um, whatever uh, the standard interface comes with the hardware or the platform, like Valve is going to ship theirs with Valve's motion controllers, which are very much like the like Razer Hydra controllers in terms of functionality. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're really great, but they're, again, they're very great for very specific types of interactions. They're great mm -hmm. for swinging swords. Uh, one of the demos they showed us, um, uh, which was something I never really expected to, to, to experience, but it was uh, this thing called Tilt Brush. And it's basic three D, basically three D painting. So in one hand you have um, a palette thing, and you can slide your thumb on. It's got one of our haptic touch pads on it, and you oh, can nice. slide it, and it spins this wheel around. It switches from brushes to you know what color you want and textures and all these things. Yeah. And the yeah. other hand is your brush, and you just start squeezing, and you can just walk around. Yeah. The yeah. Val's tracking solution uses this thing called Lighthouse, where you can have a fifteen foot area and literally just walk around in it, and mm. it tracks you in that space quite well. And you can you can see your hands where they are, and it does work really really well. It's a little bit clunky, like if you play something like Surgeon Simulator, which was one of the demos they had, and you have these weird hands. And they have triggers on the controllers, and when you pull the trigger, the hands clasp. So you're standing in front of uh, uh, these tables with all these medical tools on them, with drills and all these other bits <laughs> and pieces. And you walk up to it. Just to your left is this alien laying on a on a on a stretcher, or whatever. And you know, you grab a drill, and then you turn around, you walk up to him, and you start like smashing into his rib cage and <laughs> trying to do something that's uh, vaguely like oper like an operation. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Oculus announces in the next week. I think just Ooh. they're having a, a big press announcement right before E3, mm. and I think that's when they're going to finally announce Controls. the whole launch schedule, what software we can <coughs> expect at launch, what their input solution is, um, and then once everybody knows that, I know from being heavily involved with the indie development community on Reddit and all the guys that develop most of the, the, the you know the, the best demos out there. That's one of the major discussions. Is always what is the input solution? What is the input? Yeah. Because you're killing us. We can't we can't make any bets on what what to yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at least for me, when when I was developing for Lunar Flight, it was the gamepad. In fact, I put a gamepad in the pilot's hand. You look down and you have an Xbox 360 controller in oh, here because cool. it was optimized for that sort of experience. And pretty much everyone who buys my game, I tell them that's the thing. And most people would already have one mm. or a gamepad like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then it's safe uh, to bet that it is going to be a gamepad, isn't it? Um, who knows? In uh, terms of the short time, like turnaround from my engineering perspective, like to get something like that, because they've probably only been looking at it in the last few months, considering uh, Vive only announced everything. In I think that was through. March. I think they threw Oculus a big curve. Well, Oculus knew nothing about that. Yeah, and, uh, it's yeah. kind of you know, <laughs> it's so, kind of funny to wake up uh, and find out about that. So, like a turnaround by Q one for. A, Brand new input source that yeah. uses like a lighthouse. And Val was saying, "Hey, hey, out. Oculus, if you want to use our <laughs> tracking solution, here you go." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So I think uh, Val was definitely uh, was it pulled the rug from underneath Oculus and kind of like uh, shaking things up. Fairly. They couldn't even get demos. I heard like o the Oculus people trying to get Valve to give them demos. And there's a bit of bad, bad blood between them now yeah. because Oculus took so many of their engineers away. Mm. So. Yeah, it is really uh, quite interesting that there's been such a big fuss made about this, considering that Sony was always using the Move. Now, I know the Move has optical problems when you include it, but um, the motion control argument only came back when Valve showed it off. I don't think people were taking um, 
motion controls in VR overly seriously until... I think it's largely because everyone... There was only a Razor Hydra, really, that people could get access to. They were very hard to get access to. They had issues. They, were some, they weren't perfect. And when you get them set up, they're actually pretty cool, but they, you still have calibration issues. And you're doing I've it. had a go on them. Yeah. yeah. Very um, cool. We and won't uh, talk about Kinect either. So. Yeah. So <laughs> well. I've tried the Morph- Morpheus. is actually surprising. I, I kind of discounted it early, but they've come a long way. And okay, they've... yeah. Oh, how, I haven't tried the Morpheus at all. So what's your kind of experience with that so far? Uh, it was actually really good, and I yeah. hear it's a lot better. I tried it at SBVR, which is Silicon Valley Virtual Reality. Oh, yes, yeah. You know, which is the first one they ran previous year, hmm. and they had one there. And that was the first kind of headset they had there. And it was great. Like, it, it was... 60 frames per second mm. the display was really good um, the tracking was really really good it was fairly limited and when you, you think about you know back then you're like how, how, how much can they get out of a PS4 really you know? yeah yeah but so by the way the Sony Morpheus is a virtual reality headset for the PS4 yeah yeah and it's gonna launch next year as well so okay. 2016 is gonna be the year when all the hardware 20, hits the market and that's then the year yeah. all these companies that made bets on it like Sony mm. uh, Ubisoft has just announced that they've actually started investing in a team who's making VR content. CCP okay. is making a VR grid. So there is AAA content out there being made. So that's what I said before, there is, there is a, a, a pretty good hunch from all these you know big industry luminaries from Valve, from John Carmack, to all these people that yeah. this thing's gonna happen. Right? Yeah, it's happening. It's just a matter of time. Mm. Uh, it just t- t- going back quickly to the input devices, because I'm really interested. I've, I've had a go with the Hydras. Um, and, and again, like the challenge is getting developers who are, are going to bet, if you will, on creating content that if it integrates an Omni, for example, how many people are even going to have an Omni? So is there, I just wanted to bring up, is it Open VR by Valve? They're working on a system, and maybe Alex, you want to kick it off to you? You probably know a bit more about it than yeah. I do, actually. So like Open VR is they're basically trying to write a set of interfaces so that um was that developers can effectively hook in like any device that they want using the standard set of inputs. Um, so it's kind of like uh, if you have like a kind of like a PS Move or um, Lighthouse solution, you can use kind of the similar interfaces and have um, like the developers only implement it once and then just use OpenVR to um, abstract all of that data for you. Wait, is this um, Valve or is this OSVR? It's Razer. Yeah. 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 OSVR is, the, is the hardware, isn't it? I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah. By Razer. They kick so Open VR is there's by a lot of, Valve. a lot of people involved. Valve is involved with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. yeah, so. yeah. Does anyone else know about Open VR? I, they sent me an email last week. Okay. <laughs> they haven't yeah. responded to it. Oh, right. <laughs> it's it's still... It, yeah. Responded emails. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so even OSVR. So OSVR, from what I know, is um, is more of the open source, open sourcing of hardware side of things. Do you want to kick that off, Kieran? Well, uh, ultimately, um, I wonder whether it's good for developers. I certainly mm. know that it's, as Razer is concerned, it's it's good for them um, because they're doing a headset as well, apparently. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not overly concerned about dealing with that. Like, they can they'll be concerned about people using their headset. Um, Nettling controls <coughs> in VR is really freaking hard. Like, mm. you can go and give somebody the same control. You can give them a first-person controls for an FPS game, and people will throw up within seconds. It's amazing. Um, getting it to work right takes an enormous amount of just tinkering, testing, and just grabbing people who haven't had... Like, they haven't had enough experience with VR to have developed a, a sort of... A tolerance to it yet mm. and just seeing what happens and seeing what they do mm. because it's a completely new playing field and so um, one thing I'm quite worried about is everyone's going to try everything there's going to be devices coming in and stuff like that and it's just going to waste a lot of people's time and money so I'm actually staying away from that one okay um, just because I you're going to wait it out yeah, I think it's. I think oh, it, the it's an attempt to try and say, hey, you can use whatever device you want. Mm. Um, we can already use whatever device we want. Like mm. we, you can plug joysticks in and things like that. Um, it's more a case of like you've got to design you, your experiences around what the devices can do, mm. um, and spending extra time on other extra peripheral devices really is. It's a nice to have, but if you're going to do it, you've got to do it right. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. like 
The Connect is the best example. It sounds great, but if you ever body track yourself with a Connect, your arms and legs are prone to just jittering all over the place. We've, we've done something like that, yeah. Okay, and now you will be amazed how quickly that makes you nauseous. It's not motion sickness, but mm. it's just unsettling. Your brain just goes, no, I don't want to be here. It's it's really really bad. I've seen I've seen that happen somewhat in a um, a social VR setting when we were doing a uh, it's called VR chat meetup mm. and someone was using their connect and the hands were going everywhere and and it was is really strange to see uh, to be looking at that person while they were speaking and then and it was again like you mentioned really unsettling. Oh yeah, for them it would have been a nightmare. Yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah. So I mean again, I, on in terms of that in terms of creating experiences and then. Um, I know I've talked to Alex about this before, creating experiences that kind of hijack uh, natural phobias or put people in situations that automatically force them into almost, yeah, pretty much force them into more Challenge immersion. state. <laughs> yeah. So, so with your horror game and, and other things that you've looked at in, in terms of getting people more immersed, what are some of the, I guess, tips that you could give? even developers, new guys, anyone in the room who is starting to create content, what are some tips of, of getting people more immersed into that virtual world that you're creating for them? It's pretty much just down to the input. <laughs> like, uh, for the most part, um, was it we rely on a lot of, uh, was it a lot of really subtle cues and just like building up tension and all that stuff. Um, and a lot of uh, the design that uh, my co-developer goes for is very much dark areas and all that stuff because with our um, UDK version of Montas we're only on um, was a dev kit one so we've only got 720p to work with um, so a lot of that was based on using a lot of lighting and all that stuff to really set the scene and um, it was it it's all down to design pr principle um, if you're wanting to make people have like a happy fun joy time then you're probably going to have more like uh, less like guys running around trying to stab you and all that stuff so um like uh with like the lowest common denominator for absolutely everything is just input like um i am going to admit guys like um, the demo that i'm going to put out um you guys are going to be guinea pigs because i don't get to test this stuff much um but basically uh test 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 because the biggest thing is like people will go oh I'll just use the default implementation from uh, an engine or something like that and just hook it in and expect it to work um, but then yeah never mind the fact that the engine for example Unreal Engine at the moment has a little bit of a bug where uh, was the vSync is uh, locked to 37.5 frames a second and I can't get up to 75 frames per second so I apologize for that as well for today's demo um, but yeah, there's a lot of other engine problems. You gotta really think about the actual uh, was it implementation of your game. So uh, jumping in and um, how many lights you've got in the scene because that chugs through your performance and really trying to get um, something called uh, motion to photon latency. Um, so basically what that is, is your movement equating to the time until the light is actually processed to your eyes. Um, so that includes uh, time actually like rendering that stuff whether you're buffering frames at all or anything like that um, and also down to the actual uh, motion tracking as well so if the motion tracking is taking a sweet ass time or um, was it, or you're using some weird setup for your uh, ik if you're doing some body awareness like i am um, if you're not using uh, the camera as the master of all of the positions you're most likely going to be um, offsetting that latency and the motion um, to photon latency will go through the roof and anything I think it's over seven milliseconds which we're still not at yet so optimally around about 20 milliseconds is where you want to go for at minimum um, is, it, is what you want to go for so uh, unity and UE4 and all that stuff allow you to at least get the rendering pipeline but you have to really think about your design from the perspective of how you implement it. Are you going to be adding latency um, in any section? Um, and every game like with VR is going to have to rely on this. Um, it, and then for a uh, phobia perspective and all that stuff, for us, we use a lot of like, uh, I think uh, we have one awesome uh, example uh, from Montas and UDK is you um, wake up, like Montas has got some surreal elements in it. Um, 
So you wake up in a room and you're a midget and there's like a massive chair and you pick the chair up, you move it around and you've got to like jump on the chair to open a door and then as soon as the door opens it's just white and there's nothing, you don't get any sense of depth except for when you throw the chair out the door and the chair just falls forever and the first reaction that you always see people do is like look over the edge and go holy hell that is really deep like um, and so like for us we try and like play on natural phobias like um was it we've got a little bit of arachnophobia in montas we've got a little bit of uh was it scared of heights stuff so um was it um, and then like a lot of dark sections and all that stuff and a lot of stuff that goes in the corner of your eyes but um, that's a lot of design background and you really have to just like test that like if you're a game developer like the mantra is like don't expect it to work just test 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 because um, with Montas uh, all throughout early access all of our builds have been using the exact same levels we just mix and change and see what the uh, community says about it and whether they liked it or not um, so yeah from an immersion perspective though like start from the actual input method getting everything right and then um, at the very end you really want to optimize as well um, but it all comes down to design yep may i ask questions is that right uh yeah sure i was just really interested in what you were saying testing 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 yep. that makes all sense do you test with the sound do you just test the visual imagery without the sound first? Or well, do you combine? How do you... we combine. So um, for the most part, uh, with the actual immersion part, with uh, this demo, there's going to be no sound. Um, but that's because I'll be focusing mostly on just um, how the um, person feels when moving around and all that stuff, if it feels natural and all that stuff. So um, what you want to do is you want to cut out other things at very first stages, but when it all comes together, have it all in there. Um, test it, get it like feeling really good for the player, um, and then it'll pay off a hell of a lot. Like I can say that um, was it when you get an implementation, even like grab your next door neighbor or something like that, and just pull them into it. Um, someone fresh, because um, if they keep on, if you keep on getting old and old people, uh, they'll get used to your system, and it's not a good test bed if that kind of makes sense. Um, so from I think everyone can agree basically it's a fresh eyes. There's definitely a lot of um, really interesting things you don't normally have to think about when you make content for VR mm. and, and there's a lot of perception issues that you have to suddenly think about when you from when you're making traditional games that you don't really have to think about anymore. Right, right. The most obvious one is perception of scale and how big objects mm. feel yeah. and, and how you how you build your content out. Uh, an example is my game Lunar Flight. Um, I'd always thought it was built to scale. It's a fl it's a flight simulation simulator. Everything should be you know, built to you know, perfect units, mm. whatever. Mm. Um, and it just turned out that uh, I'd actually built it at a thirty percent scale. It was thirty percent of, of one unit. And when I first dropped Oculus's. Uh, camera controller into the scene, mm. everything was really small. It was about a meter, the, the lunar module standing next to it was only a meter tall. Oh. And I never really had thought about it until I'd done that. And right, like, oh, right, right yeah. so I have to think about this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that was turned out to be a fairly easy fix. You can, if you just change the distance between the, the inter-camera inter -camera, camera distance between two cameras, it changes your perception of scale. Okay. Yep. Um, and people often get that confused with IPD, which is a physical thing. Oh, okay. Between, with the lenses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so uh, yeah, perceptions of all sorts of things like sound, uh, in particular the project we're, we've worked on recently, um, and uh, in fact Oculus has a demo, Oculus has an internal team called Story Studio, Oh yes, yeah, and they're a bunch yeah. of ex-Pixar people, and they made this little short film called Lost, where you stand in a forest, and um, mm. they, they are really exploring this whole thing of how do you how do you direct people when you can't direct them where to look? Yeah. Like how, how can you cue them to, to look at things um, when you can't control the camera, because you can't control the camera in VR, right? If you yeah, do that, that's right. when you make people sick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so they use sound very effectively, and mm -hmm. they use they, they, they use contrast and, and imagery to try and draw your your focus to things, mm. and make sure nothing else kind of draws your, your attention mm. away from that. Mm. So in their demo, you're standing in a forest, and one of the, the, the very early things you see is um, uh, you're sort of standing in a bit of a clearing, but everything else is really dense forest around you, and you see kind of the bushes and stuff moving around. It's night time. Yeah, yeah. And there's like little fireflies and stuff flying around. And suddenly this bird just goes boom, past your ear and it like makes this fluttering sound. And they use 3D audio as well. They got a really good 3D audio yep, library. Yep. And uh, 
yeah, that sound, you hear the bird come from behind you, and it passes your right ear and then it shoots off over that direction. You, and you naturally just instinctively you want to see follow going right. yeah. where the sound goes. And yeah. then suddenly you're looking and they bring in the new object. So we're riffing on this whole thing as well in, in our work that we're doing at Liquid, where um, we're introducing characters, all these characters come in and they're, they're saying mm. various things to you. And we want to make sure that when one walks out of the scene, the next character is coming in in that direction or we'll make a sound so we kind of draw your attention to look in, in, in yeah, that yeah. direction so yeah there's a lot of perceptual stuff that you really have to think carefully about that again you never had to think about before right right yeah yeah and so I mean uh, Wilf could comment on this in terms of the hardware side of things it's, it's almost going back to the input devices but for example Wilf you've been looking at eye tracking um, things like that with the, for example the Fove uh, in terms of how and, and with your st your storytelling background with film um, how do you see that playing out? We've talked about audio cues, um, and, and even with head tracking, you could almost do it. Do you want to give us a, some examples? Of yeah, well, eye tracking thoughts? is really, really useful for VR. Um, if you can track someone's eyes, you can do n numerous things. Mm. Uh, one, one nice thing is you can actually um, allow them to focus on different elements in the VR scene like you would in real life. So, you know when you go to see a 3D movie, it doesn't quite look right there's elements in focus and out of focus but you can't naturally focus on things in that field so with eye tracking you can track where the pupils are and if they're looking at you know objects up close or objects in the background and then and then change the the um you know the the the, the, the focus the depth of field um to, to correlate that so that's a nice aspect but um as a sort of a control with your eyes that's a really interesting thing so you can have elements you know events in your in your game um that are, you know contextual that they are aware of what you're looking at and, and even when you blink things like that um so this is you know a really powerful tool for developers to have um you know, eye tracking because um you know you can you can give people really i guess engaging experiences if you can track where they're looking and uh and and it's early days but there's you know immense you know really interesting opportunities there um to explore as developers what you can do with eye yeah. tracking you, yeah. you can imagine interacting with uh artificial characters yeah and uh establishing eye contact with them yeah and suddenly yeah. they've got your attention and they, they can respond to those sorts of stimulus and say for example I'm, I'm i'm guessing as a game designer you you could incorporate things like you'll the character will only continue conversation um, having a conversation with you yeah. when you're looking at them, at them in the eyes yeah. as soon as you turn away maybe they could trigger hey look back at me exactly you know yeah. don't don't be disrespectful or, or whatever and then yeah. bring back that attention in order to kind of give that guided progression through the yeah, you, know, you know when you play, I don't know if you guys play Minecraft and the Enderman if you look at the Enderman he comes after you yeah. like you but you kind of look you know he's over there but you don't point the crosshair right at him uh, <laughs> yeah. right yeah. in VR that'd be a different thing right he'd know when you're looking right <laughs> yeah, at him. yeah yeah your head's yeah. over here but you're looking over that way yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They can track those eyes, yeah. It's like uh, a um, per type AI I made in Montas a while back for the VR. Um, basically, what it was was uh, kind of like, who's watched Doctor Who? Um, do you know? Everyone has to know the don't blink thing, right? Um, so there's like, uh, was it angels or something like that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Stone angels. Um, and yeah, basically, like when you blink, they move to you. So like, you could definitely do stuff like that. So with um. Was it with the Fove, this new headset um, that's developed by Lachlan Wilson? Yeah, 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 so yeah. he's based he's out of the Brisbane. Hat Brisbane space. guy, yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, like, you can, because he's reading your pupils, you can also see where the like where they're closing their eyes and all that stuff. So for horror games, holy hell, I would have fun <laughs> with that. It would be good. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's also like um, rendering opportunities. So um, there's something called uh, foveated rendering, which is like, uh, basically like focusing all of the uh, detail at where the pupils are and then just blending out because really um, for your eyesight um, four percent of your eyesight is just crystal clear the rest is slowly just blended out and like just yeah your periphery um, so and that would save on the hardware side of things right yep. yeah absolutely in fact, in, nvidia just released a tech video based on their new game work stuff for directx 12 okay and their new graphics card so they actually part of the the rendering process now where uh, the outer part of the barrel distortion is rendered at a lower resolution than the yeah. inner part of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And would you say, Wolf, that would help a lot with the hardware side of things in terms of uh, the graphics? graphics. Uh, oh, yeah. It's yeah. going to make it more affordable for people, you know, if they can optimize the frame rates because you need very high frame rates to get that, you know, that fluid experience. So, 
um, having you know foveated rendering mm. optimizes it gets you know the most performance out of your hardware yeah yeah and then for mobile as well right you'd be able to run I'm guessing you'd be able to run it on mobile experiences much longer because you're not burning that battery power as much Hard to say or maybe the other eye tracking would increase the amount of yeah because okay, it's going to be it's going to be taxing the CPU to do the eye tracking so mm. whatever the solution is I think the real thing is that it's going to reduce the main problem for maintaining frame rates on mobile which is the GPU um, it's too easy to max that thing out and if you mm. only need to render detail in the center of someone's vision then you go, can go to a lower resolution outside of that well then the GPU doesn't need to do as much work per pixel because it's only doing one-to-one -one pixels where you're looking yeah yeah um, so that's that'll simplify problems but yeah obviously it creates other problems with how much battery power is being used to run uh, a set of like uh, eye tracking cameras mm. and processing yeah. so not sure about the battery but it's certainly improved the frame rates yeah mm. yeah yeah well I guess like the next question that we, we we're getting to is or not a question it's more of a discussion about what sort of platform you want to create your VR content on and so uh, I, I'm not sure about Sean but I know Kieran's uh, really into the unity and then we've got Alex is really into the Unreal Engine um, but how about you kick it off Kieran with with especially with the new release of the or the unity 5 mm. you you've I know you've expressed some uh, dis uh, dissatisfaction unity. with it yeah Unity announces a new feature. Just keep yourself uh, minimum safe distance away from it in case it explodes uh -huh. until they've actually fixed it. Yeah, they're known. Uh, the company is known for releasing features well before they're actually ready for developer use. Mechanim was a spectacular failure until I think two revisions afterwards. They're still fixing problems with it. It's still everyone's still just asking them why they didn't just buy Havoc behavior and implement that. Um, so yeah, Unity having their try at VR, no, the moment, in addition to that, all of the other um, first like external libraries like Oculus mm. SDK and all those things do not play nicely with Unity 5. Right, right. So um, my actual usage of Unity 5 has been extremely limited because I just cannot update my projects to it because the they will stop working. So you're sticking to Unity for for at the moment. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, so <coughs> yeah, there is there is a definite lack of confidence in mm. Unity's sort of cross-platform implementation. It'll eventually get there, but mm. they don't have a good track record on this. I did go to a um, a talk at River City Labs. I'm not sure if you were there. Maybe a few of the audience were there, and um, we were talking to the Unity evangelist, and, and he did mention the the platforms that they want Unity Five mm -hmm. to ultimately build directly to, yeah. and they had a huge number of platforms on there. One, two of them were of which the um, Oculus, mm -hmm. the Oculus Rift, and then the Samsung Gear VR. Yeah. So I mean, it's exciting. I think they obviously they're obviously aiming to get there eventually. Um, but what about uh, Unreal Engine? What, what are the challenges are with 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 um, developing VR content for that and and then the benefits as well are you finding there's a lot of support within the community let's just say that uh, was it with um, was it the unreal engine community it's only really started budding in the last year since unity uh, since unity unreal engine 4 um, mm. basically the reason because of this is because uh, UDK was basically just released as kind of like a quick uh, middle grounds between getting a uh, was a, a really AAA quality engine, so you get kind of all of that good features of the engine, but you don't get all of that customization that you might get from, say, Unity or other engines. Um, but with Unreal Engine 4, um, it's really opened up uh, the possibilities because now, um, like, even though they don't document absolutely everything because they're so on the bleeding edge that they're just, yeah, they don't invest enough time in uh, documentation, um, the source code is there for developers to look at. Now, that incurs other problems. You have to really, like, basically have to have a programmer at hand who knows what he's looking at to really jump into the engine and uh, check this out. Like, um, I was trying to see how um, all of the Oculus stuff is integrated and all that stuff, and you basically have to follow through all the interfaces and all that stuff, see how it's all implemented from their end, and then hope to hell that the uh, the driver and the runtime handles everything else for you. Um, 
So with uh, Unreal Engine, it's like a great tool, but you have to be invested in learning it. Um, Unity is great um, for people who are just starting out um, mm. and kind of like getting into that stuff. Um, both you can get equally as good uh, as it results, I think. Um, but I think that there's also the possibility of more power that can come from Unreal Engine. But there's still a few things that uh, was it um, Epic needs to deal with in terms of uh, virtual reality. Um, so, for example, as I said before, um, for some reason with an NVIDIA chipset um, capped at 37.5 frames per, per second, which is the vSync refresh rate. Um, and that's a bit of a problem at the moment, especially since uh, that means my motion to photon latency is through the roof, um, which causes people sickness. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of stuff in there that's already built there. So like, um, was it some of the IK systems I use in there are uh, basically stock standard and then I've added in my own, uh, was it um, animation systems in there to kind of like, uh, bolster it a little bit more. So um, there's the possibilities of both sides of the um, spectrum where you can get really good results from Unity and really good results from Unreal Engine. Um, it's just a matter of which one you're more comfortable with. Um, and I think that the learning curve is a little bit higher for Unreal Engine if you want to really do complex stuff because you have to learn C++. Um, uh, but Un Unity is, yeah, not too bad from that perspective. What's your opinion? I'd say that there's a mixed bag with both. I mean, yeah. I, honestly, I'm my long-term plan is to switch over and start using Unreal, but at the moment, across any VR platform, the performance is just terrible, mm. um, and they need to fix that. So it's, it's really a case of there's work to be done, but the potential for high performance overall is, is definitely in Unreal's court. Mm. Not sure that it's actually more complicated. I mean. Unity is nice and easy to use at the simple level. Mm. The problem is that it falls into that lovely black box problem. You yeah. don't know what it's doing in there, and yeah. it's quite often it's a complete and total mystery. And you can get halfway there by decompiling Unity, which, yes, they actually encourage you to do this because they don't document everything, how everything works. Um, so, if you are planning on making a game with a lot of scope, you definitely want to go with Unreal. Yeah. Um, Unity will just break apart at the seams when you start going beyond a certain team size and stuff like that. But Epic hasn't put in the time to fix several critical issues with VR, so mm. at the moment if you're planning to release something with VR from Unreal, it's kind of, you're in dangerous territory. Mm. Whereas Unity, all the Oculus plugins and stuff like that, they've been making them themselves, and so they're kind of on the bleeding edge. Yep. Yeah. And, so. Uh, Ooh. Sorry, I should say as well that um, was it Artyom um, is regularly on the uh, so Artyom is like the basically the lead uh, is he the lead Oculus like uh, runtime programmer or something like that for all the plugins and all that stuff. Um, he's regularly like talking on the boards um, for Unreal Engine and all that stuff. Um, so uh, basically, there's a lot of support that could be potentially there, but I think uh, at the moment their focus is definitely for Unity and trying to bolster that solidly and then move on to Unreal Engine, but Unreal Engine, um, all of Epic are uh, really uh, trying to push all of their, well, a few dedicated devs to just VR, um, so there's, uh, I can't remember his name now, but uh, they did a talk um, for GDC this year um, and did a lot of uh, work with a few, did you see the demo by any chance? Uh, it's like rolling car demo and stuff like that. The yeah, Unreal one. one? Sorry? The Unreal one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. With the street scene? Yeah, I, yeah. That no, one. I haven't actually seen that demo. Ah, I saw that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, was it, they've got like, um, you can get some really good results on it, uh, but it seems that from my perspective, uh, it really is only Epic getting those results. Um, and I think that's because they really have all of their in-house team there at hand. Um, so until they start pushing those changes out, um, I think uh, it's safe to say that they should be good by the time everything's done, but yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah. Sean, did you want to, what, what platform are you using at the moment? I, I, I use Unity. Yeah, I've been using Unity for like maybe four years now. Has uh, anything these guys said make you feel like you want to jump ship? No, not really. No. Um, okay. Yeah, for me, for me, there's um, like I think Karen for me is probably having the most experience I know with 
with Unity mm. and had a look at uh, Unreal, can sort of look at the two and say, yeah, you know, these are the strengths and weaknesses of the two. Yeah, I don't have yeah. an opinion on it because um, you know, I've never dove into Unreal 4. Okay. Um, but for me, it's like if I was to do that, I think that the downtime that I would have trying to refamiliarize myself with Unity mm. 4, um, yeah. sorry, Unreal 4, uh, just wouldn't be worth the time. Yeah. Uh, given how much traction I already get out of Unity when I want to do something. So mm. um, I've been working with it long enough that I kind of know what to avoid and what not to do. Yeah, and yeah. You, know, you just sort of, every 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 kind of uh, engine you know, has those sorts of things, right? They have things right. that they're good at, things they're not good at. And sometimes you, you have an idea to do something <coughs> and you, you waste heaps of time trying to make that thing happen. And mm. sometimes you just got to go in a different direction to mm. uh, get, get the results you want. Um, so yeah, for me it's like I said, it's 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 a um, definitely a. Oh, we're using Unity Five at work uh, on our project at work, and we're using the latest O Six SDK with it. Um, we've had no problems with it at all, but it's a completely fresh project with a very passive type of experience. Mm. Um, so it's literally you know, there's no input. You just have this experience. You sit there. So it's all completely fresh. It's all. Uh, there's no, not a lot of code going on in the background that has to mm. interfere with that stuff. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's for me. I'll, I'll just keep using Unity for now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until until it gets to that point of you know maybe I'll cross over now. Mm. Yeah. I think I think you're going to see like from the performance side of it, a lot of people don't really know how to optimize their assets, their mm. content. Yeah, yeah. It's one yeah. thing to optimize code, but it's another thing to understand how to build content mm. properly. Mm. Uh, to uh, make sure it's, it's not the thing that's that's dragging and it down. As I said before, test, test, test. <laughs> like, uh, was it if you have a hunch that something's going to be, uh, was it more performance uh, intensive than something else? Try both. Like, I think was it John Carmack that said uh, basically, "Por qué no lost us?" No. Um, like he basically said, uh, "Try both and see what's better," because like you gotta learn something from it regardless. Um, I know that uh, was it with our like one of our little prototypes. So uh, I learned a lot about um, using lights properly in a VR scene in Unreal Engine. Uh, uh, that was a big. Thing. I'll give an example of a weird thing with Unity Five that we ran into. It's just not related to VR, but just what Unity's like. Um, so Unity Five comes out, and we switch over to Unity Five, and we noticed we. I think this may have been in Unity Four because it was actually related to the new UI system, and. Uh, We'd notice every time our game would start up into a level, we'd get all these huge spikes in performance. And we're like, what the hell's going on there? Like, and we're, we're coming up with all these things that were completely not related to what the problem ended up being. And um, it actually turned out that uh, with their new um, UI system, if you auto size, have a, uh, a label, like a text label, and you let it auto, auto size itself at runtime, like say the, you know, the, the label gets bigger and it basically readjusts itself. It actually regenerates the font cache, and on mobile, that just like kills it, right? <laughs> so the best thing to do is just make a really high resolution um, static font and just use that. Oh, it right. doesn't have to yeah. do that anymore. Yeah. But yeah. we didn't find that out because until we hooked it up through, through the profiler, through Xcode, and and back in the Unity and looking at it, going, what's it doing with the font? Like whenever we saw these spikes, it's doing something with the fonts there, and that's how mm. we found out what it was. Yeah. yeah. But given given that Unity. Is um, you know most of its market is in the mobile space, right? Like, right. It's not, even though they do all these high-end rendering, high-end PC stuff, they don't really make most of their money out of that. No. And you would think something like that would be like something that would be caught really early. <laughs> it's such a, it's, an obvious thing. Yeah, something you'd kind of expect from a platform. Like or at least that. they'd tell you, make sure you yeah. don't do this. Or it wouldn't be on by default. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes back to the the issue about any feature that Unity's built recently. Mm. That's the kind of little spiky bits which mean that it's it's not reliable there's a lot of people out there still rolling their own or like yeah doing yeah it. like there's an old competitor like an old not competitor but the, um the old framework that people used to use was a third party one called engui mm. and it's still 50 50 with the new system just because it engui is a pain in the ass to use but it's the devil you know mm. uh, whereas the new one with engui it's uh, it's a third party thing. It comes. You can actually take it apart and say, okay, he's doing this here. With the Unity one, it's not quite complete, and it's a mystery as to what's going on. So right. there is the font cache gets re rebuilt without telling you, and it doesn't even show up in Unity's own profiler. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's the kind of problems that you have when you go to the new versions of Unity. This sounds like these are all challenges from being first movers, first people into mm. the VR space and creating content for VR. Mm. Um, 
and and my hope and for you guys as well is that it, it becomes a bit easier for the creators of content um, and also for people who are creating the hardware to be able to create peripherals for everyone to kind of the, bring both of those sides together right and then allow for a better experience for the consumers um, so I mean as a final uh, a wrap up question as as guys who are on the cutting edge of um, creating VR hardware and software and content what are the two tips that you would give uh, speed round um, to the audience to beginners or to, um, to whatever whatever in creating VR content okay so um I guess my first tip would be who are you creating it for are you creating it for yourself do you want to make money do you want to you know try and make a game that you know people buy um, think about your customer think about you, the person who's going to buy your game and what platform are they using are they a mobile gamer um, are they a hardcore PC gamer and and then that will help you obviously choose your engine and, and your, your strategy there um, so yeah just have a think about the end user um, in, in VR and that will help I guess guide you know what engine you use um, for us we're building some apps we're using unity just because um, there's you know, some good optimizations and the shade is there for mobile um, so we have to think very carefully about how to optimize things you know to the nth degree I'm sure you can do that as well with Unreal Engine 4 but um, yeah it's just uh, and, and the second tip would just be um, you know get involved there's a you know a VR club there's a lot of you know these game tech talks um, there's a lot of help out there um, so just yeah if you if you if you most questions can be answered pretty pretty quickly um, it's rapidly growing the knowledge of of, of, uh, of VR sort of tech related questions so um, the reddit community is great um, and uh, yeah there's a growing forum on unity as well yeah. um, we're starting to build a forum on our own website as well to, to help people with questions so um, yeah just you can awesome. find a lot of answers online. yeah yeah awesome Sean what about yourself what are some two tips two tips um, geez I don't know performance and minimalism target low low spec stuff like yeah don't try and do high-end stuff at least from the content side mm. like try and try and do something that's within the means of the hardware um, and make sure it runs really really fast because that's the only thing that really matters uh, yeah, to the, yeah. You, know, you, you can have uh, the best best interaction model that you could come up with or the greatest idea but if it runs really slow no one's going to want to experience it yeah yeah uh, so it makes them feel like that sickness right yeah yeah so if you, you're pushing too hard like maybe just pull it pull it back and go for something simpler mm, awesome what about you Kieran um, I'd focus on uh, the game design side of stuff. First of all, there's two points. First of all, everything you know is wrong. You've anything you know from previous games, previous platforms, previous development. The rules have gone out the window. It's like the tablet generation, but it's ten times, worse. ten times worse in terms of what's changed. Um, you don't like the rules about how you can control things and everything like that. It's completely different. Um, and the second point leading on from that, make a lot of small projects that you can test and throw away or change or if you're building something build lots of small prototypes like the the, the adage of you've got a choice with two options build both options you have to it's not a choice a case of it would be nice to you must because if you have two control schemes and you think one's better than the other the only way you're going to find out is you actually do both because no one has any experience in this field yet the only way you get experience or any insight into how it works is by really trying both. No one has tried them yet. There's a good chance that you're the first person to do it. And the only way you're gonna find out is if you actually put the time in and find that out for yourself. Awesome, awesome. What about you, Alex? I think I can solidly agree with that. Um, I think I remember talking to you at PAX and you said uh, you went through eight prototypes before you got to the hoverboard yes. simulator. There yeah. are eight different versions of controls. And uh, that will, just for the animation stuff, um, like getting the rig properly done and all that stuff and moving around, that's probably iteration three that you guys are going to try out and it's going to be ruined because of the uh, 37.5 cap. Um, but uh, the other thing is don't be afraid to take a hit on the jaw because like if like one thing is is that when we went down to PAX and I demoed my game um, people don't care if they hurt your feelings um, and they'll just like kind of like beat you down go what's the point of the game like um, it feels gross like why did you do this like what the hell were you even thinking you go 
I'm sorry, man. All you have to do is like take it as problems. Don't always agree with them because sometimes they might go, oh, you really need to put on some like lerping algorithm or something like that to make it smoother between transitions when you're like leaning in the game and that's like the worst thing. But you can take that as a problem and think about, okay, this is the problem. How will I solve it? And once again, do both. Like if you've got two ideas, do both, test it out. Rapid prototyping is like the biggest thing. Um, and then once you've got it solid, keep it there and then try out like little increments, not big like I'm going to do this massive thing on top, tiny little increments until you get it all right and test it all and keep on um, trying it out on fresh blood because uh, there's nothing worse than uh, giving it to the same old person like your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever and just like, yeah, having them go, yeah, it's great, babe, and kind of like, yeah, looking away with uh, shifty eyes. So, um, yeah, so try it on people who don't give a rat's butt about you um, because they're going to give you some sweet feedback. And don't take it to heart because, like, the way I see it is you just improve and improve and improve. And by the end of it, you'll be good. So, yeah. Awesome. Great tips, guys. Uh, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you, everyone, for um, being here today. Uh, and I'll um, let Ashley take it from here. But um, yeah, these meetups are uh, every Sunday, very first Sunday of every month. Game Tech and Game Dev happen here. So um, thank you for coming along. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Have a great day. Oh yeah, questions guys. <laughs> um, how important is the graphics quality in this new VR experience? Last few decades focus on photorealism, that sort of thing. What does that matter? I don't think, personally, I don't think it matters at all. Um, you know, ultimately, people will, will accept stuff. In fact, stuff that is less um, going to draw your attention to things that aren't right and more likely to be more believable. They can suspend your belief for longer because you're not going to focus on things that are wrong because nothing is right, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Uh, one of the demos that Valve showed me um, the first time I went there, which is their earlier prototype with the room with all the fiducial markers all around the room, if you've ever seen that, they the outside in tracking thing. Mm. Uh, it was just a room um, that was just a screenshot from a, like a Google, I think it was a YouTube page or something like that. And it was just on all the surfaces in the room. And this is the one uh, Michael Abrash would talk about, like when they first started talking about presence and you know, getting people to, there was a, you're basically standing halfway up in the room on a block which has the same texture on it. And he, they get you to step off the block. Oh, yes, and you're, yeah. you're just natural instincts to not want to do that uh, because you, your, your brain is believing what it's seeing. That was only because the, um, the latency uh, and low persistence tech, that technologies that they come up with there were giving your brain such a solid sense of being in a space um, that you believed it was there right so um, taking that and making an environment that is like uh, super hot I don't know if you've seen that game it's all just flat shaded polys a lot of people are doing old style you know um, the low poly ones. faceted yeah. looking geometry in yeah. environments and they actually work really really well so that's what I said before you just pull back you don't need to do that because you if performance is an issue and you're trying to make it run on a low spec mm -hmm. device you can do that it'll still be fine and you'll still have a great experience Mm. That is like the biggest problem that we're going to have um, because for Montas and all of our projects we're using like a semi-realistic um, look mm. um, and part of that is if something, yeah, as Sean said, if something looks out of place it's going to stand out like a sore thumb, especially in VR. Especially if you, um, like uh, I said this at my last talk at the VR club, um, mm. like uh, people these days use normal maps like crazy. Now in VR, that stuff is great at distance, but as soon as you get close up and you're looking at something, it's just going to look as flat as like your shiny kitchen floor and that's it. Yeah. Um, so you really have to like play around, think about um, how you're using your assets and whether or not you really need to use them. And uh, don't forget that people can get their faces right up close to something um, and have a look at it. So. Uh, it depends what you're going for. If you're going for an art style that's like super hot where it's just flat shading and all that stuff, people aren't going to worry about getting really close up. Um, and then you can use uh, design principles like having like 
really high detail stuff as like an attraction point or something like that. And we use design principles to guide people through that. Um, but Cartoony stuff yeah. works really well too. I've tried, uh, did you try Lucky's Tale at the last SFV? No. You heard of Lucky's Tale? It's one of the first games yeah. that Oculus invested in. They've got, I think the guys made Words with Friends before that little team that did that. They did some, I think, Facebook game or mobile games yeah, as well. Yeah, they had yeah. some popular one. And these guys are making a, essentially a 3D platformer, mm. cutesy platformer like a Mario style game. And their world actually appears, um, what they learned about um, solving some of the camera issues is that they design the world so you're basically always moving. The camera never sort of turns 180 degrees. It's sort of, the world is kind of designed in this snaking kind of fashion. So the camera's always looking forward and it, it mm. kind of always, it moves laterally, but it never does a full rotation. You can still look all the way around. And the other thing that is the world is actually like, I think it's um, like the character, he's about this big in front of you. He's really small and you're, you feel really big in the world. So you can lean right in and look at him. And because you're, the vectorization of motion in this space is really low, you don't really feel sick at all, mm. but it looks really cool. But you can tell their art style is really optimized for a low spec machine, but it still looks great. You know, it really depends on how great your artists are. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And great. Gonna, oh, that's gonna, that's yeah, you gotta uh, remember that you're basically rendering that thing twice or next to twice. So uh, keep that in mind at all times. But, yeah. That's a great question. If there's any more questions, we're going to the pub, I believe, after this. So um, I'm sure most of these guys will be around to answer any more of your questions. So um, yeah, thanks for coming guys.